But what I want to know is, growing up, were there artists in your family? Were the fine arts well represented in your family's collection? I will answer that. <laughs> but first, I have to say how wonderful it is to see so many old friends here. I, I had no idea whether anybody was going to come to this. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fantastic to look out and see so many, I shouldn't say old, although uh, <laughs> longtime friends. So, um, And the answer to that is no. There were no artists in my family. There, were no, there was no talk of art. There was no original art on the walls. Art never crossed my mind or entered my life until I went to college. Now, you went to Davidson, right? I did. Yeah, and why that uh, institution? What drew you there? That's a, that's a funny story and a little bit of an embarrassing um, story of uh, youthful arrogance and <laughs> cluelessness. Um, I grew up always planning to go to Duke University. I, um, the, whole, the whole time I was growing up, I planned to go to Duke. It was kind of the best known elite college in the South at the time. And, um, and I followed their basketball team closely growing up. I played basketball and, and baseball up through high school for the high school teams. And, um, and when it got to be the beginning of my senior year of college, I decided to uh, my dad asked me where I was going to apply to college and whether we should go and look at colleges. And I said, oh, I don't need to, I don't need to go look at colleges. I've always said I'm going to go to Duke. I'm just going to apply for early decision and, and go to Duke. And, you know, I, I was a nerd. I, um, I, uh, it was a town full of nerds. The people that I went to school with were mostly sons and daughters of nuclear physicists and nuclear engineers at the Savannah River plant, uh, a, a nuclear facility that we called, without a trace of irony, the, the bomb plant. And, um, and I, was, I was a serious nerd student. I you know, got all A's in school and, and great SAT scores. And I went to um, Florida State University between my junior and senior years of high school on a National Science Foundation program for nerds like me from all over the country. And we did original research and got to meet Nobel Prize winning scientists. And, um, and so, you know, I just thought, well, I'll go to Duke. And that's, the, that's where I've always wanted to go. And, and my dad, who had been a farmer when I was growing up and then became a, a teacher and was at that time a guidance counselor on his way to becoming a school superintendent, was horrified that I wasn't going to at least look at other schools. And, and, and he said, well, we should at least go and look at Duke, because I'd never been there. And I said, well, OK, if you really insist. <laughs> and so we went up there on a Saturday, and we didn't make any appointments or anything. And, and the offices, the admissions offices were closed. And they didn't know me from Adam. And it was kind of a cold um, welcome. <laughs> I and you know I I was shy and I um, I I was really put off and uh, and I I couldn't relate at all. It was it was a big school and um, and I and I was I was at a loss. I thought well you know this doesn't look like a place that I I want to go and um, and. Uh, I was crestfallen, because I'd never thought about going anywhere else. I was just going to apply for early decision and go there. And my father said, well, you know, we're going to be driving by Davidson College on the way back home to South Carolina, and why don't we stop there? Because he had, he had always thought a lot of Davidson, and it's a small school, a thousand students at that time, um, highly selective. Um, and. Um, and I didn't know anything about it other than that they also had a really good basketball team. Even though they only had 1,000 students, they were a top 10 team in the country at the time with Lefty Drizel as the coach. And um, so I said, OK, we can, we can stop there if you really want to. And we got out on a Saturday morning, and we walked onto a beautiful, beautiful campus with these beautiful oaks. And um, it was just like the most picturesque place in the world. And we're walking across campus, and there is this guy in an ROTC uniform, Colonel Outlaw from the ROTC program. Now, this is 1968, and 
uh, I, you know, striking up a conversation with somebody who was an ROTC officer was not at the top of my list, but he came up and he introduced himself and he said, uh, and he, he said, are you looking at the school? And, and we said, yeah. And, and he said, well, let me, let me take you to lunch over in the student union. And we went over to the student union and um, he, he called um, uh, one of the professors and, um, and had him come out and, and talk to us. And it was, he was just so incredibly nice and everybody was so welcoming. And, um, and uh, I, so I, I fell in love with it. And so I said to my dad on the way home, well, I guess I'll apply for early decision to Davidson. <laughs> and I didn't know anything about it. Um, and I wouldn't have been interested in an art program even if I'd known they had one. So, um, so I, that's where I went. It's the only place I applied. Now, you also met Missy, your future wife there. And she was the first woman, right? It did uh, turn out that way, yes. Um, at the end of my freshman year, I, um, a friend of mine and I drove down to Atlanta to go to Six Flags over Georgia. And uh, he was going to have a, a date and go to Six Flags Over Georgia with a former girlfriend of his who was at Agnes Scott College. And Davidson was an all men's college. Agnes Scott was an all women's college. And, um, and Missy happened to be the roommate of um, the, his, his friend who was gonna go. And I said, well, yeah, I'm not going, I'm not gonna be the third person in an amusement park. Um, somebody's gotta, I have to, you have to get me a blind date. And so her, Missy's roommate cried, and even though Missy had midterms the next day and a date that night, um, uh, she went to Six Flags over Georgia with me. And, um, and we fell in love. And two weeks later, she came up to Davidson for the weekend, and at the end of that weekend, we got engaged. And, uh, <laughs> and we were You don't waste time, do you? <laughs> Never had a hard time figuring out what I wanted. I guess <laughs> and, not. And uh, and we were married for forty years. Um, uh, so she came to Davidson the next year. She could take classes as the uh, uh, as the wife of a of a Davidson student, but she couldn't be a degree candidate. But all the um, schools of that sort in the country were that were single gender at that time were starting to go co-ed and the academic vice president actually um, after getting to know us a little bit um, approached us and said to Missy would you like to be the test case for co-education at Davidson and then the school was 135 years old at that time and it was a big deal and so um, uh, we said yes she said yes and and uh, and she became the first and only uh, uh, graduate of the class of 1973, first and only woman graduate of the class of 1973 and the first Davidson woman graduate. Wow, now um, she also was responsible for redirecting your potential career, right? You were headed for the science or engineering track and moved over to the arts. Absolutely, absolutely. Art had never crossed my mind. If anybody had told me when I was a senior in high school that I would be an artist, I not only would have been surprised, I would have been highly offended. This was you know, not something that I thought that a serious, bright, ambitious person would waste his time on. But uh, uh, Missy was taking an art class, and the class was out drawing on the, on the campus lawn, and uh, I wandered over one day and uh, Herb Jackson, who was the painting professor who became my mentor and is, along with Missy, the only reason I became an artist, um, brought me a, a drawing board and a big piece of paper and a set of oil pastels and, and I sat down and um, made, a, made a painting of trees, if you can imagine. <laughs> 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 Again, you don't waste time. You yeah. go right to the center. And it was, and you know, uh, it, it really had never crossed my mind. And it, to, to tell the truth, it was, it was the first thing I'd ever done in my life that I not only was really terrible at and couldn't do it all, but couldn't even imagine ever being able to do. 
And um, that may have been part of the attraction. I don't know. Um, uh, but, uh, but basically, I fell in love with art, just as I had fallen in love with Missy. And, uh, and Herb Jackson, who became my mentor and sort of showed me by example that this is something that a bright, ambitious young man might want to do with his life, um, was a, a guiding light for me. And I never turned back. Yeah, I, I know that. Well, now, Missy eventually became a physician, and I'm wondering, did your love of science influence that track at all, do you think? Oh, far from it. <laughs> <laughs> no, she had no interest in science whatsoever, um, and really never after, <laughs> never took a science course after the eighth or ninth grade that she didn't have to take. And uh, it was years later after getting a degree in art history and being a full-time <coughs> studio potter when we were living in Anchorage in the late 70s. I was the uh, artistic director at the Visual Arts Center there. Um, she decided she wanted to be something professional and uh, so she, she decided she'd be a lawyer. She took the law school admissions test and she got a great score and uh, she made appointments with five different lawyers in town to talk about where to go to law school. And she went and talked to them and every single one of them said, you don't want to be a lawyer, this is a terrible, <laughs> terrible profession. <laughs> it's not too late, <laughs> don't, don't do it. And you know, she was in her 30s by this time. And, um, and so she was crestfallen. And so uh, about a week later she said, well, maybe I'll be a doctor. And um, and I said, well, that's great, but you know, you haven't taken a science course since the ninth grade, <laughs> and you hate science and math. And um, and she said, well, I guess I'll have to take some courses then, won't I? And um, and she took three years of undergraduate science and math courses, and uh, went to medical school for four years, and did three years of residency, and became a doctor. Well, with her art background, as you were maturing as an artist, was she? Would she comment or critique or offer? She absolutely would. You know, I, I used to tell my students that, uh, that it's really hard when you're a student that somebody's always looking over your shoulder. You're, you're, the faculty's always looking over your shoulder and criticizing you and seeing everything you do and making judgments about it. But once you get out of school, it's, it's really hard to get anybody to ever give you creative and, and direct and honest feedback again. I mean, nobody ever comes to my studio and <coughs> looks at my work and says, boy, you know, that didn't work out well at all, did it? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but Missy would. <laughs> and, um, and she didn't have any hesitation about doing that. And, and she was not only uh, an artist and an art historian herself, but, but a great critic of my work. Now, from the South, how did you two end up in Alaska? When That's another good story. Um, when I was in my final year of graduate school in Idaho, at Idaho State University, I heard about a job as a curator at the Alaska State Museum. And I applied for the job early on in my last semester. And I, I talked to the director and the deputy director there several times. and. They kept saying, um, you know, we're very interested in you, but this is a state agency and we have to hire an Alaskan if we, if we can. We have to hire off the state register or at least hire, hire an Alaskan. And, but, but we're very interested in you and if there's nobody who's qualified, you know, stay in touch. And so I called periodically over that last semester and, um, and uh, I got more and more intrigued with it and more and more interested, but the end of the school year came and, and Missy and I packed everything up and I graduated and we moved back east and we got on my motorcycle and we rode to Virginia where her mother lived and uh, she took off for England with her two sisters and her mother to go on a, a sightseeing trip to England. And I decided I would just get on the plane and fly up to Juneau to the State Museum unannounced, not tell them I was coming or anything, and, and I talked to them about, about the job. And so I got my backpack and my Coleman camp stove, and I, 
and I got on the plane and, uh, and I came up to Juneau and I just showed up in the director's office at the Alaska State Museum and I said, hi, I'm Kess Woodward, I'm the, the guy who's been talking to you and I'm really interested in this curatorial job and, uh, and they said, well, you know, we have to hire an Alaskan if we, if we possibly can. And I said, well, what does it take to be an Alaskan? And they said, well, it takes being here with the intent to stay. And I said, well, I guess I'm an Alaskan. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and right on the spot, the, the director and the deputy director were there, and without batting an eye, they said, can you start tomorrow morning? <laughs> I was honest to God. <laughs> and um, and this will tell you how long ago this was. I, I telegrammed. I telegraphed my wife in England. I, I had an itinerary for what hotel she was going to be in, saying, um, I got that job in Alaska. <laughs> when you get home, can you put all our stuff in the van and drive it out because I have to go to work tomorrow morning? <laughs> and, and she did, and um, as she always said, um, the, um, I, though my body has strayed outside Alaska, uh, many times since then, my, my heart's never budged since that day. So what about the state really appeals to you, Kes? What, what's the magic there? You know, the same thing appeals to me today that appealed to me then. It was the, the population in Alaska was much younger then, almost, uh, you know, six or eight years younger on average than it is now. But I was 25 years old, and uh, it seemed like everybody there were lots of people my age, and everybody I worked with at, you know, in my job was older than I was, but there were lots of people my age, and everybody got up every morning and thought, well, you can do anything in this world that you want if you just have the energy to do it. You, you, we sort of can create the world anew every day. And um, there have been a lot of changes in the last 41 years since then, but um, I still feel like, I still feel like that, and I still feel like there are people like that, and I still work with young people today at the university and elsewhere who feel like that, and I don't think, I don't think that's changed very much at all. It's, I, I go back to the South where uh, the question is always, who are your people and how long have they been here? And, uh, and I love that about, about Alaska. That, that, in, that in, you know, looking out here and having connection to so many people, I, I just being so interwoven into the fabric of not just Fairbanks, but, but really all of Alaska. Now, um, since you began your career here as a curator, I've often wondered about small regional museums and the strategies they have to adopt in order to succeed. Is it better to focus on perhaps regional art rather than try a, a broader perspective? What do you think about those things? You know, here in Alaska, even, even the largest museums are small by national and international standards, and, and the, the, the view of all Alaskan museums is that kind of that the world ends at the Alaska border. Um, the University of Alaska Museum of the North is somewhat of an exception in that we, we do collect uh, work from all over the circumpolar north, but um, it, it wouldn't make any sense at all for Alaskan museums to try to build international art collections and get third and fourth and fifth rate old masters and, uh, and things of that sort. It, it, it makes a lot of sense for Alaska museums to collect work that's about Alaska and the North. And whether it's smaller museums like the ones in, in Homer and Palmer and places of that sort that, are, that really have high standards but are, but are smaller, or the Alaska State Museum or the Anchorage Museum or the University Museum, that's what we've all chosen to, to focus on. And I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Now, of course, you've written books on some of the early, really pioneer painters uh, in Alaska. Um, did your research for that inform your art at all as you were maturing or in, and developing as an Alaskan artist, guess? I think it must have. It would be hard to say exactly how it influenced my work. Um, one thing, 
since I immersed myself in being a curator and getting to know the work of other Alaskan artists as soon as I got here, one of the things that I see in retrospect now, I, I didn't really see at the time, is that when I came to Alaska in the 70s, nobody was painting the forest. Everybody was painting the mountains. Um, it, it was all about mountains. And, um, and I didn't consciously note that and decide to start painting the forest. But I, I think in retrospect, maybe, maybe the fact that all of the great historical Alaskan painters uh, painted mountains and, uh, and panoramic landscapes may have influenced my interest in focusing closer at hand and focusing on the trees and the forest. Now, what drew you to the University of Alaska Fairbanks? That, that, was, that was serendipity, too. Um, my wife, Missy, took all the... I, went, I was at the State Museum as a curator, and then I was artistic director at the Visual Arts Center in Anchorage, and then I went back to the State Museum as a higher-level curator for two years, and Missy took all the science courses she could at the campus there. But there was only one place in Alaska that um, organic chemistry was offered, and you had to take organic chemistry to be able to apply to medical school. And um, her idea about that was, well, we must have to move to Seattle. And I said, no, 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 they, they have that in Fairbanks. <laughs> and, um, and so I quit my job at the State Museum with no prospects of anything up here. That's the way we had always done things. Whenever either one of us had a crazy idea, we would just, we would just do it, you know? <laughs> we would just say, oh, everything will probably work out. And so we just packed everything up and we moved to Fairbanks and I got an uh, adjunct teaching position that first year that um, we were up here when she was taking organic chemistry and some other courses. And, um, and then, by pure chance, the first uh, tenure track position in many years opened up in the art department, and I applied for that. And I'd been an artist in Alaska for several years by that time, and was well enough known that I could be a contender for that position. And and I was lucky enough to get the position, and um, and then taught here for the next 20 years. Well, before we leave Juno and get to Fairbanks, I just have to ask, as it just occurred to me, is it true you lived in a yurt? <laughs> yeah, you know, everybody, it seems like half the people I know in Alaska have a story about living in a, um, in a, a, a tiny little waterless cabin when they first came here. Missy and I lived in a 13-foot diameter wooden yurt um, 17 miles north of Juneau with uh, no running water, no electricity, no telephone, I um, and we we had to park way down the road and haul water in and, and walk up through a trail through the woods and up a fallen log that had steps cut into it to get to the yurt. And um, the real deal. The real deal. It was like a dream come true for me. Um, <laughs> less so for her, um, <laughs> since we only had one car and I took it to work every day at the museum. Um, but um, I, but I, in fact I. I, I dug a, a line and put in a telephone line, and I called my dad in South Carolina, all excited, and I said, I said, Dad, I have a telephone. And my dad very dryly said, well, what won't they think of next? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so, yeah, that was, that was my rite of passage. Okay, so here in Fairbanks, who was in the department then, and, and what did it look like when you got there? Uh, it was a wonderful department. I, you know, I have to say, I looked forward to going to work every single day, and to the people that I worked with every single day in the 20 years that I taught in the art department, and in all the years that I have continued to be involved with the department since then. Um, Glenn Simpson, who's here tonight, was uh, a mentor to me as a faculty member, and Ron Sanungatuck was the chairman of the department. Pretty much everything I know about uh, living in Alaska and doing things in the wild is thanks to hunting and fishing and being with, uh, with Ron and Glenn, and, um, and much of what I know about teaching uh, came from them as well. So they were there. 
Um, Terrence Choi, Terry Choi, some of you may remember, was the painting teacher at the time. Um, Catherine Zulsdorf was the sculptor at the time. Barbara Alexander was the art historian. Stan Zielinski, who's still around, was the ceramics professor at the time. Um, and uh, Glenn was teaching metal smithing. The Native Art Center was going under, under Ron Sanungatuck's direction. And uh, it was about the same size department that it is now, but it was just an undergraduate department at the time. Well, that raises a great point. So when you put together, especially when you move into a graduate program, you must have to cover certain bases for the disciplines within art, and then also have a respectable art history program so that there's a context. Yeah, you know, to a certain extent that's true, but uh, every art department, particularly smaller art departments, have certain things in common but have a lot of diversity. Um, you have to have, you pretty much have to have an art historian, you have to have a painter, you have to have a sculptor. Uh, some art departments have ceramics programs and some don't. Some have fiber programs and some don't. Some have photography programs and some don't. Some have printmaking and others don't. Bill Brody was another of the people who was there in the department and active when I, when I first came and was there for many years. Um, so uh, there's a lot of flexibility and it really has a lot to do with what the people there um, are interested in and the kind of leadership that they show. Uh, Stan Zielinski really built the ceramics program. We had an incredible metalsmithing program, thanks to Glenn. We had a Native Art Center, thanks to Ron. Those are really kind of unique things for a small department of that sort. Now, last week, talking with your friend and sometime collaborator, Peggy Shoemaker from the English department, um, she really cited the growth in, and the burgeoning number of fine Alaskan writers. How about for the arts, Kiss? Did you see a growth? Obviously, as a, a professor and mentor for many young artists, you've watched their careers, but how's the state of art uh, grown in your time here? Oh my gosh, it's, it's just grown tremendously, and so many of the most prominent artists in the state have come through this program. Um, I don't take credit for them. We don't necessarily take credit for them, but at least we didn't ruin them. Um, <laughs> um, you know, there are people like Kathy Carlo, who was a student in the in the art department, and has become one of the most well-respected uh, native artists in the country. And Sonia Kelleher Combs was a painting student of mine for many years. Annie Duffy. Um, you know, I, I mean, I could I could list people for the next half mm -hmm. hour who have gone on to. Um, to become some of the most prominent artists in the state. Um, the, uh, it's one of the most gratifying things in the world to have a student, like Mary Verhoof, for example, whom, whom many of you know, I suspect. Uh, Mary Verhoof took a, a design class for me and, and, a, and a couple of painting classes for me when she was just starting her schooling. And she, she finished here and she went off to graduate school in Iowa and she came back and, uh, and she taught classes. And, and so I, I really, I had her as a student in one of her first college uh, art classes. And then 20 years later or 25 years later, I wrote the catalog essay for her solo show at the Anchorage Museum. And, as a, as a teacher, you can't ask much more than that for uh, a gratifying experience. Now, you also served as uh, chair of the department and, and had administrative duties. Uh, the arts here, of course, the university was founded as an agricultural and mine-centered uh, um, institution, and I think the arts only came in gradually and a little bit begrudged uh, to a certain extent. Um, when it, there are tough fiscal times, is it harder as an administrator to argue for the arts, do you think, funding for the arts? Historically, it has been here and everywhere else, but we've held on pretty well in, in the art department. Um, you know, 
having having the Native Arts Center, having Ron Sanangatak here early on, and, and Glenn Simpson, and, and people like Bert Ryan around, and uh, so many important Native artists coming through the program, and, and Ron's successors, uh, Jim Schopert, and Harry Calkins, and, and Alvin Amoson, um, people like that, uh, lent a certain amount of credibility to the department that, uh, that got us through uh, the incredible downturn in the in the mid '80s and the, the next biggest downturn in the in the late in about 2008, 2009, 2010, and um, the art department's been able to to hang on pretty well, and the arts in Alaska have hung on really well. Uh, we've been able to make the case that uh, that the arts are good for the spirit of the place, good for the economy of the place, good for the vision of the place and uh, we've had our ups and downs but, uh, but we've we've survived um, I want to just broaden that briefly before we uh, go and talk about your work after you retired but you've also uh, participated on the national level in many committees and and groups so a broader perspective it always seems to me that um, the arts on a national scale are also having a tough time and, and have to struggle for funding. Absolutely. And Alaska has been um, really at the forefront of some of those, some of those battles. And the leaders here have been leaders um, on the national scene as well. The directors of the State Arts Council here have been movers and shakers on the national level. We had one of the first uh, percent for art programs in the, in the nation. And it's been challenged and under siege any number of times, but it's never gone away. Um, and uh, it's a it's a struggle, uh, but uh, we've we've continued to make the case, and and we've found ways to show that a healthy society needs the arts, and and to include the arts along with science and technology and engineering and mathematics as being important elements of what a great university and, and a great state needs to be at the forefront of. Mm -hmm. So after 20 years of teaching, you decided to retire and devote yourself to painting. Now, traditionally, that's a tough gig. Um, before we turn to your art specifically, what do you tell young painters and artists about making a living doing their, their passion and their art? You know, there's a, um, there's a contemporary painter whose, whose work I've always admired uh, named Chuck Close, who has a quote about that that I, I always tell people. Um, people ask him sometimes, um, you know, where, how do you, what do you do when you don't have any inspiration? Or where do you get your inspiration so you can start working? And he sort of scratches his head and says, uh, you know, inspiration is for amateurs. Professionals work. Um, and, yeah. and I think that's, that's really 99% of it. Is I go to my studio, I try to be in my studio by 9 o'clock every morning and go to work and I paint all day. And when Dorley has rehearsal in the evening or is practicing as she does many long hours of the day, um, I go back in the evenings and I paint more. And, and I was not burnt out on teaching when I retired in 2000. I was loving teaching. And, uh, I just wanted to see what I could do if I just went to my studio and I painted all day every day and I it's still kind of a miraculous thing to me that I that I get to do that um, I, there are very few days in my studio that I don't stop at some point and just say wow I can't believe I get to do this mm -hmm. but that's that's really the key is is you just do the work and you you follow you know, you, you do what you're called to do, and you put the work out there, and you hope that people are interested in it, and, and that you can, can make a living at it. Well, you mentioned Dorley. We should say that um, several years back now, Missy, of course, passed away, and um, you met Dorley, and at about that same time, her husband died, and so several years later, you married. Now, she's uh, a 
flutist and uh, the principal of the Fairbank Symphony Orchestra on the faculty of UAF's music department. Uh, does music play an increasing role in your inspiration now when you're painting? Both music and Dorley play <laughs> incredible role in, uh, in my life in, in every aspect, including my work. Yeah, you know, that's the other big watershed in my life. In, in 2010, uh, my, my beloved wife, Missy, we were in our 40th year of marriage, and she was working out at the athletic club, getting ready to take a long walking trip in Spain together, and um, she had a heart attack completely out of the blue and died. And uh, without any warning or you know, any, any rhyme or reason. Um, and, you know, my life was just, I, you know, it, it was just unbelievable. Um, and amazingly enough, um, two weeks later, my longtime friend Barry McQueen died. Not quite as suddenly, but just as unexpectedly of a runaway infection that uh, he'd been fighting for some time, but which we all thought he was going to beat. And, um, and Barry and I had traveled all over the country together to museum conferences and roomed together and done all sorts of things together as colleagues. And, and uh, Barry and Dorley had been at mine and Missy's 25th anniversary party and at countless other events together. Um, but Dorley and I had never had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and we're still <laughs> discovering, um, <laughs> we still, nearly every, every few weeks, we'll, one of us will say, well, you know, I was at the party at that person's house 30 years ago, and, and the other one will say, oh, I was at that party too, and you know, we just never, never noticed. <laughs> um, and, and we probably never would have gotten together, but Barry and I, had been working for uh, two years along with Margot Class on an exhibition of our artwork about birch trees in the boreal forest. It's something Barry and I had dreamed of and talked about for more than 25 years and we'd been working two years on it. We had a museum tour around the state all set up for it. And if it hadn't been for that, Dorley and I probably would never have had more than a social conversation. Uh, but I, sometime after Missy died and, and Barry died, um, I called Dorley and said, can I still use Barry's um, photographs so that we can do this exhibition? And she said, certainly, and she'd be happy to help. And, um, and that put us in contact, and we, as we were working on the exhibition, we began comparing notes about our uh, mutual slog through the slew of despond, and uh, I think each of us felt like uh, they were, the other was the only person in the world who could understand what we were going through. They were in their 34th year of marriage, and Missy and I were in our 40th. And, um, and to our complete amazement, over the next year, we fell madly in love with each other. Um, and three years later, we got married. Um, and, and that is, you know, one of the very happiest things in my life and also just been a revelation to me because it introduced me to music. I knew nothing, absolutely nothing about classical music. I had been to a handful of classical music concerts over the years, mostly under duress. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't know, you know, Beethoven from Bach or anything else. And, so I'm now engaged in a long-term remedial music education program <laughs> that's been going on for eight years and uh, hopefully will go on for another 40. And it does directly play into my work. I, there are pieces that I have made in the last few years that are based on um, musical concepts that I'm learning about in addition to the mathematical concepts and, and the scientific concepts that I have been involved with for, for so many years. And so Dorley is a, a major inspiration. And I, I tell you, it's just, an, I mean, I have, I've led a charmed life. I, I truly have. I'm, I've been really lucky that, um, uh, with the exception of um, 
the Pirates beating the Yankees in the seventh grade, uh, seventh game of the 1960 World Series, and my mother dying young, uh, and Missy dying. Uh, everything's going fine, you know, and um, uh, I and I feel incredibly fortunate to have discovered the world of music when I was 60 years old, and it's like there's this whole world out there that I'm now just so enjoying learning about and, and being a part of. And um, we leave tonight after, after midnight for the, what will be the eighth national flute convention of Dorley's that, uh, that I've gone to, and uh, with 3,000 other flutists. That truly surreal scene, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I'm, I'm now immersed in the world of music and, and so much richer for it. Well, you mentioned uh, your love of math and science. You had a chance. Uh, you were tapped to be part of the recreation, if you will, of the Harriman expedition. And, of course, scientists were a part of that, and Vera Alexander was also tapped to be a part of that. Did that satisfy both your artistic and your scientific geekiness that you cited <laughs> earlier? That was the trip of a lifetime. That was, uh, that was really the, the most incredible uh, experience of that sort I've ever had. The, the Science Museum at Smith College in Massachusetts organized on the 100th anniversary of the last great exploring expedition to Alaska, the Harriman Expedition of 1899, a kind of recreation of that voyage. And that 1899 expedition was probably the most amazing group of people ever to travel on a single boat. I mean, each of the leading scientists in every field in the country and John Muir and John Burroughs and uh, several major American artists and uh, the photographer uh, Edward Curtis who became the great chronicler of the North American Indian um, and, uh, and what the college, what the museum at Smith College tried to do was put together um, a trip that would follow the route of that expedition for 30 days um, stopping at all the same places along the entire coast of Alaska up through the Bering Strait and down the coast of Siberia. And it was, it was wonderful to get to go to those places and every day go ashore in uh, zodiacs and, and each do our respective kinds of work. But it was even more amazing to do it in the company of uh, incredible scientists, incredible writers, and, and uh, I couldn't believe I got to be the expedition artist. Or, um, and um, it, was, it was truly the trip of a lifetime, not just for me, but for people on that trip who had traveled and done many more remarkable things than I had. Well, let's turn to your painting then. Um, from those early days on, on the campus of Davidson uh, with your tree, uh, <laughs> <laughs> picture. Um, have you noticed uh, your technique, your style, your, your approach to your subject matter change at all, Kess? My approach changes regularly, um, but my subject matter changes little. Uh, you know, I, I tell people um, only half jokingly that most artists paint lots of different subjects, but they paint them all the same. And I paint pretty much one subject. <laughs> I mean, I paint the landscape. I, I do paint things other than trees in the boreal forest. I paint mountains and rivers and, and even people sometimes, but for the most part, I paint the boreal forest. But I, it's real important to me that when I go to my studio, I'm doing something new all the time. And so people regularly remark um, when I have each solo exhibition um, that it looks different from the last time. The subject matter is often very much the same as the last exhibition, but I'll move from oils to acrylics, and I'll move from thin paint to thick paint. I'll move from more detail to less detail. And I'm always, I'm always trying to sort of trick myself into painting myself into a corner where I'm trapped and I have to work my way out. Um, I think the hardest thing about being an artist for a long time is avoiding making copies of your own work and eventually making parodies of your own work and, and finding ways to 
keep it fresh and to, for it to be pitched battle the way it is for me. Um, part of that is not a lot of, um, not a lot of natural facility. Um, so, uh, you know, there's still many days in my studio that I think the same thing I thought that first art class I ever took, you know. Why is it that I ever thought I could be an artist? <laughs> and, and, um, I, honestly, that's, that's so true 50 years later. Um, and uh, that's, that's the key for me, is to be doing something new all the time. And I've been lucky enough to do things like, like work with uh, Jan Daw and the group that are, that are doing research on the boreal forest, to, um, who have made me see birch trees in, in new ways, notice things about birch trees that I've been painting for 40 years and had never noticed before. So again, I, I lead a charmed life. I just sort of stumble along and I do my work and people call me on the phone and they say, how would you like to do this? And, and I go and, and it's eye-opening and it's revelatory and, and I just try to respond to it. Well, I wanna talk about a couple of collaborative uh, projects that you've been a part of. But first, one of the elements about your painting that I find interesting is they operate at at a remove, so if you're farther away from them, they resolve into, you know, something I can grasp, but I look cl more closely, there's an abstract sort of fractal pattern going, running through them. And is that part of the intent? And how do you capture those different scales in one painting? I do a lot <laughs> great difficulty, right? Yeah. <laughs> I do a lot of walking back and forth in the course of every painting. Um, you know, it's a peculiar way to paint, and every every artist has his or her own idiosyncratic methods. And for whatever, I started out as an abstract painter, as a non-representational painter, and I painted purely abstractly for many years before I became a, a representational painter. And uh, I. What, when, I, when people who don't know my work ask me what kind of work I do, I say I paint big abstract paintings that happen to look like birch trees. Um, and what I always want is to have my cake and eat it too. I want when you're across the room and you first see that painting for it to be all about birch trees and the boreal forest. I, I, want, I want it to say something uh, meaningful, personal, about light in the, in the north and the boreal forest. But what I used to tell my students all the time was that from across the room, a painting needs to be strong enough and dynamic enough to make you want to go up and take a look at it. But that's only part of the job. You know, if, if, if when you go up and take a look at it, you can't see anything different than what you could see from across the room, then it's failed. And so what I am always shooting for is that every step I take towards the painting, I see something different. I see things that I couldn't see from across the room. Until when I'm up close enough to be practically nose to nose with the painting, it's completely abstract. I can't tell where, where I am or what I'm seeing. And it makes for a peculiar way of painting because I go up and I work on the, I, I stand back and I get a, kind of an idea in my mind of what I want to do, and I go up and I paint, but when I'm close enough to touch the canvas, all I see is paint, and I'm really having a great time pushing the paint around and getting involved in the colors and the patterns and the textures, and I realize, oh my gosh, I have no idea where I am. So I stop and I walk back across the room, and I, and I get it all clear in my mind again, and I go back and forth and back and forth like that all day long. I, I never let my students, uh, when I was teaching, uh, paint sitting down. I would tell them, you have to stand up because if you, if you paint sitting down, the only place, the only distance it's gonna work from is right there where you, right, right in front of you. And so I'm always, I'm the extreme other end of that. I'm always moving back and forth across the room because I want it to be completely abstract up close and completely representational from far away. Now, I know you and Dorley run through the forest all, three times a week, and, and you're both avid runners. Um, so you must observe the world around you on a, a quite a familiar basis. 
But how do you do, how do you bring it back into the studio, Kes? Do you take an image, or are you just so familiar, or does a, a piece of the landscape or the or a tree say, okay, I've got that. I'm going back to the studio and represent that. Again, my method is is kind of crazy and kind of idiosyncratic. I I. I don't carry a camera. I haven't carried a camera in years. I do have an iPhone, and I do take snapshots for reference. Um, but when I'm out in the landscape, I try as hard as I possibly can not to even think about how I might paint it, whether I'm in Denali Park or whether I'm in the forest in the woods behind our house. Um, and, and I fail at that. I mean, I can't help but think about it. But I, but I, I try really hard not to. I try to just be there in the forest, appreciating the forest, looking at the forest, seeing the trees, seeing the mountains, whatever. And, and then I go back to my studio and I work on whatever I'm working on. And I, months later, sometimes years later, I'll go to my studio one morning and I'll think, okay, now this experience that I had this many months ago or this many years ago, has kind of worked its way down to a place in my consciousness where I have something, maybe not profound, but at least personal to say about it. Something more than, isn't this a pretty place? And I never know when that's gonna happen. Um, and, and for somebody who's as obsessive, compulsive, and orderly, and neat, and tidy as I am, it's very strange to me how little control I have over what I paint. I only ever work on one painting at a time, um, and I worry desperately about every painting of how it's going to come out, and uh, and I, but I don't know until I go to the studio in the morning, what to start a new painting, what I'm going to paint, and I can decide I should do this or I should do that. It doesn't make any difference. I go to the studio and whatever I need to paint, that's that's what I that's what I have to paint, and um, and I do use my snapshots for reference. Uh, particularly for things like painting Denali, where everybody knows what the shape of every little peak and ridge and things look like. You, can, you know, if you're painting anonymous mountains, you can get away with all sorts of things. And one of the great things about birch trees is they're very forgiving. You can do all sorts of weird things <laughs> in birch trees, and they still look like birch trees. Um, but, I don't look like that. What do I? <laughs> yeah. um, well, you, now you mentioned several um, collaborative. Um, Ventures, the One Tree Project with Jan's work, um, but also I'm thinking of writers like Peggy Shoemaker with her book Blaze, Frank Sos and Bamboo Flyrod Suite. What, what do these these uh, collaborative efforts bring to you? Oh, they get me outside my own head, and they give me the opportunity to work with people who are just so incredible and who are thinking about things in a in a totally different way from me and. I, and they make me produce things I never ever would in a, in a million years. Um, Frank Sos and I were in undergraduate school together. Um, he came up here 10 years after I did purely by chance and, and we knew each other in, in uh, undergraduate school but, uh, but we really became close friends after he became up here. But collaborating with him on the Bamboo Fly Rod Suite and other projects was very, very meaningful to me. And, and Peggy Shoemaker has been just a very dear friend since her earliest days in the English department, uh, some years after I was in the art department, and uh, working on, on Blaze together and doing a year-long project in which she wrote a poem and I made a painting in response to that, and then she wrote a poem in response to that painting, and then I wrote a, I did a painting in response to that. Uh, that those were just amazing things. Uh, John Morgan um, and I were on a long canoe trip in 2003 together. I mean, a uh, raft trip down the Copper River. And 10 years later, he wrote a, um, a book-length poem about that voyage, and uh, we collaborated on a publication for that. All of those things um, get me outside my head and make me, make me see things in new ways and give me the opportunity to, to learn from people who are grappling with the same sorts of questions about our relationship to the natural world that I am, but doing it in other mediums. 
Mm. Well, finally, I have to say, one of the pilgrimages I make every time I pass through Anchorage is in the airport there. Mm. Your work was translated into a mosaic that graces part of a column in the ceiling there. Um, that must have been uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, outside your comfort zone. <laughs> Very much outside my comfort zone. I worked with a sculptor in, in uh, Anchorage, Sheila Wine, who has done a lot of public art projects. And she handled all of the logistical and engineering and negotiating details for that, made it possible for me. Um, I really like going to my studio every morning and working all alone <laughs> by myself on exactly what I want to work on. And the only percent for art projects that I've ever done, and I've, I've ended up doing several of them, I've sort of been either tricked into doing or <laughs> asked to do and unable to say no. I, I don't apply for those things because I don't like having to accommodate my vision to uh, what I think of as being uh, some kind of uh, public sphere. Um, but that was an incredible opportunity, and and it was, but it was so far outside my comfort zone. It was two and a half years. It was it was more like putting on an opera than um, <laughs> than uh, than going to my studio and making a painting. And the good thing about it was working with another artist to to make it happen, and working with the best glass and mosaic firm in the world, the Franz Meyer of Munich who were just incredible, and thanks to them, uh, they were able to translate an image that I made into, with three quarters of a million tiny little pieces of glass and stone into uh, what looks like a, a giant painting of mine on the ceiling of the Anchorage Museum. Yeah, it's remarkable. In the Anchorage Airport. Yeah. Well, Kess Woodward, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us. Tonight. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Are you training for the marathon? Oh, you bet. You bet. We'll be out there. Yeah. And I'm looking for you out there, too. All right. Well, uh, the Equinox Marathon. Equinox Marathon, yeah. I've, I've been a runner for all of my adult life, but uh, only, uh, only a racer since Dorley and I got together. I, when I got together with Dorley, I had, to, I had to go to all the races anyway, and I realized it would be a lot more fun to run than to watch. <laughs> so, so now I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bad combination of uh, slow and competitive, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm out there. Well, once again, Kess Woodward, thank you for talking with us. Thank you.